Welcome to America's Cannabis Conversation, where you can hear experts from all facets of the cannabis business as to what's happening in this exploding industry. Keep yourself informed. Join the conversation. Welcome to the American Cannabis Conversation Midweek Update. I'm your host, Dan Perkins. Washington, D.C., the FDA announces a recall of dozens of hemp products for humans and pets. The Food and Drug Administration is publicizing a voluntary recall of dozens of pet and human hemp products after the Florida Department of Health notified the company of lead contamination. The company, MHR Brands, first announced the recall last month and has been actively reaching out to consumers about the issue. The FDA said that no complaints about health complications related to the lead contamination have been reported so far, but it encouraged consumers to dispose of the products, monitor their health, and contact a physician or veterinarian if adverse symptoms are experienced. The nation's capital. Mitch McConnell, the majority leader of the Senate, says that the legal hemp industry is off to a rocky start. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said on Tuesday that the hemp industry has had a challenging start since the crop was federally legalized and that the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated its problems. During a press conference with Senate Republican leadership, McConnell was asked about the uncertainty hemp farmers face in the absence of Food and Drug Administration guidance on marketing of CBD products and whether anything could be done to compel the agency to expedite its rulemaking to prevent farmers from abandoning the crop. Honestly, McConnell said, I'm not on top of the latest on that. The majority leader continued, but in that whole hemp space, which is what you're referring to, has been a rocky start for the new crop even before the pandemic hit, and that hasn't made anything easier. Boston, Massachusetts. A Massachusetts bill to use marijuana tax revenue for police training draws criticism. A new large-scale policing reform bill proposed by the Massachusetts House Committee would use marijuana tax revenue to fund law enforcement training programs. And at least one of the state's cannabis regulators is questioning whether that is the most appropriate use of the money. Following the Senate's approval of law enforcement legislation last week, the House Ways and Means Committee attached the marijuana funding police training measure as part of an amendment released on Sunday. Tucked inside the panel 93-page proposal is a provision stipulating that police training fund will be partially supported by funds transferred from the marijuana regulation fund. While the state's cannabis laws already say that marijuana tax revenue can go to municipal police training after covering the cost of implementation, advocates are frustrated that the legislation seems to be using the tax reform bill to prioritize appropriating funds to law enforcement at a time when they feel it should be used to support restorative justice programs for communities most impacted by the drug war. Amsterdam, Holland. CBD is promising therapy in treating cocaine misuse, a meta-study finds. A key component of marijuana shows promise in the treatment of cocaine misuse, according to a new meta-study. Scientists analyzed 14 studies from the past five years on the administration of CBD in an animal subject consuming cocaine and determined that the non-intoxicating ingredient appears to have multitude of effects that mitigate addictive behaviors. CBD promotes reduction of cocaine self-administration. Also, it interferes in cocaine-induced brain reward simulation and dopamine releases. The study published this month in the journal Pharmacology, Biochemistry, and Behavior states CBD promotes alteration in contextual memories associated with cocaine and seizures induced by cocaine. CBD is a promising adjunct therapy for the treatment of cocaine dependency. Los Angeles, California. In our last story, study shows cannabis may relieve pain caused by sickle cell disease. A study by researchers at the University of California shows that cannabis may have a potential to treat a chronic pain associated with sickle cell disease. Results from the research, which were led by the University of California at Irvine, Puna Gupta and Dr. Donald Abrams of the University of San Francisco, were published last week in the Journal of JAMA Open 
Network. These trial results show that vaporized cannabis appears to be generally safe, said Dr. Gupta, a professor of medicine on the faculty of the UCI Center for Study of Cannabis. They also suggested that sickle cell patients may be able to mitigate their pain with cannabis and that cannabis might help society address the public health crisis related to the opioids. Of course, we still need larger studies with more participants to give us a better picture of how cannabis could benefit people with this chronic pain. And this has been your American Cannabis Conversation a midweek update. Join us each day on SoundCloud or RSS feed and join us on Saturdays at 420 for a new show. This is Dan Perkins and thanks for joining us. Welcome back to the conversation and I want to welcome back a gentleman who's been with us a couple of times before, Stuart Tomic from CV Sciences. And you can find out more about CV Science at their YouTube channel. Welcome to the program, Stuart. How are you? I'm very well, Mr. Perkins. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, just call me Dan. I'm, <laughs> a quick story. I played in a, in a PGA, a senior PGA tournament in Atlanta, and I had the chance to play with Tom Kite, U.S. Open champion, and I walked over and introduced him. I said, Mr. Kite. He said, no, Mr. Kite's my father. He's back in Texas. Just call me Tom. Just call me Dan. So uh, with that out of the way, we're, we're dealing in an incredibly stressful time in this country. And the people in the cannabis industry, which is your chief science officer for CV Science, which is a publicly traded company. I work in the regulatory department, so vice president of science, regulation, and education. When we look at the, the cannabis industry, not only are they going up and down in terms of one day the regulators think they might deregulate it. In other words, they say no, and, and then the, the, uh, they work with a bank, and then the bank says, no, we can't work with you anymore. And the states say, well, you're an essential service, but you can't let the people come in. You have to do curbside. Or, or in like Massachusetts, they closed down recreational for a while, and then they opened it. And, and so it just, it's, it's been as much turmoil in the cannabis industry. And yet these are all – most of these people are small entrepreneurs that own maybe one or a few dispensaries or they're a grower. And it's been an, a difficult time for all of us. So I've asked Stuart to come on and talk about seven things to deal with stress that not only can help uh, people in the cannabis industry, but can help us in our everyday lives and help other people in other businesses. So let's start with number one, Stuart. Well, the first thing is to communicate, and, and I want to make sure that I'm, I'm making it clear that even on the CBD side of the equation, CV Sciences, our ticker is CVSI, we've been one of the first publicly traded CBD companies. Dan, we have not had an easy road at all. In fact, the CBD gang has been faced with one unexpected hurdle after another, so I just want to say out loud that I hear, we hear every other person in this industry, including yourself. I mean, you put your head on a chopping block early on to be talking about this subject. So that's why the seven tips for beating burnout come from the place of love and also our experience in nutrition. We're a life science company, and we were built out of the dietary supplement industry. So we were the first people to claim that hemp CBD belonged as a dietary supplement next to fish oil. So these tricks that we're sharing with you are tips or things we share in the health food store world. Number one, communicate. Number two, change your diet. Number three, turn off the TV. Number four, try relaxing activities. Five, get some exercise. Six, get some more sleep. Seven, there are other supplements besides cannabis. We'll talk about them. But number one, we've got to learn how to communicate. Everything you just said is true. Every unexpected hurdle is being thrown at us, so let's learn to communicate better with supervisors and the authorities and relevant coworkers about specific stressful conditions that we are experiencing. Let's start working to change expectations to reach compromise or solutions. Stuart, I have to, uh, I have to a ask you a question here. Uh, I, I, I'm... I want to speak to you about a friend of mine who I've known for a long time and being sequestered as the way we are in Florida because of our age. Um, 
he and his wife had had to spend, obviously, <laughs> virtually all day together, except going to the grocery store or the doctor or maybe the pharmacy. And what he found was that even today, that there are strong differing opinions within the household. And he said to me, you know, I don't know how to deal with uh, where my wife has very strong opinions about masks and everything else. And I don't happen to agree with what she says, but I'm concerned about the tension in the, in the household because we're so close in close proximity, literally 24 hours a day. So you talk about communications. What, 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 Give me some tips so I can talk to my friend or if he's listening, you, you can hear today. But other people, I'm sure, have found maybe they didn't know the spouse that they were married to, but the last four or five months in, in sequestration uh, has brought out information and ideas and thoughts that they never thought their spouse. So how do we deal with that interpersonal communications, which can be difficult at times? Well, the first thing that came to mind was how we, those of us, myself, in the nutritional health food store world, which was considered alternative medicine or bad form or snake oil salespeople. Come on, you remember, Dan? They made Absolutely. fun of hippies or anyone that – come on, let's face it. So I've heard for 30 years of things about – it's just a calorie. Calories in, calories out. An M&M is the same as a fig. Come on, let another person, I like sports as much as anyone, let another person blast you in the face over and over and over in your brain to prove that you're a man. Don't worry, you can sleep when you're dead. You don't need to drink that much water. Alcohol's not that bad for you. I'm just saying every single thing that they threw at us like that, that was oversimplified ends right. up being wrong. Yeah. So that was the first thing I want to share. The first thing that came to mind is we have this challenge, and it's bringing up these deep feelings about – whether we're more open, whether we're more closed, whether we're more afraid, whether we're more forgiving. So what a chance to practice, seek to understand rather than to be understood. That prayer, the St. Francis prayer, I'm not trying to go off a rail and get myself in trouble here with anybody, but the idea of seek to understand rather than to be understood, I would say what you just said, everybody's experiencing that. So, hey, mm -hmm. take care of yourself. Hey, if I'm taking care of myself, that's an act of resistance. Whether you believe in the mask or you don't, you still have to take care of yourself. Whether you believe there is a virus or you don't, you still have to take care of yourself. Whether you believe in the germ theory or the terrain, meaning your immune system is supreme and king, you still have to take care of yourself. You know what that might mean? Uh, that you have a different belief system than the person that you've lived with your whole life. What a chance to really join forces as a couple. We're not set up to cope with this kind of sequestration, social distancing, and mask and all that stuff. So let's, let's, let's move on. What's, what's your second point? Well, the next thing, and it bleeds into your first question, and I want to make sure that I answer this in a succinct way because I've spent my whole life with what you just described. I was the wacko, oddball person that was drinking wheatgrass juice or super blue-green algae or taking care of myself, and I was doing the wrong thing instead of drinking Pepto-Bismol. I'm using that, you know, so my suggestion is if you really feel like you're on the right track taking care of your health, you don't have to tell other people what to do because you're confident in what you're doing. So change your diet. No more nervous snacking on candy or cookies. I hope we can all agree. Instead of yes. getting frustrated about whether it's keto or vegan or whatever, how does this sound? My mentor, Dr. Hector Lopez, MD, one of the smartest people I've ever met, came back from a giant conference on nutrition. I said, Doc, save me time. What did you learn? You were there for three days. He said, here, listen closely. Eat less, more. Okay, that's simple. So eat less. Don't eat as many calories. Don't eat Pam and Spam and Ding Dongs and Chicken Nuggets and Hoes and Krispy Kremes. And Damn. add some more plants <laughs> into our diet. <laughs> oh, my let's favorite try to remember that the I know, but the food inside, like the immune system in the gut, that's where the nutrition people can really help the cannabis community because we've known of things for years before cannabis was the big thing that you could eat like, I don't know, fruiting bodies of mushrooms. 
You know, and there are now even mushroom supplements or there's supplements that are, uh, you know, based on food that you would eat that would cause an immune stimulation in the gut that would help strengthen your entire body. The next one, three, we've talked about this before. Turn it off. Turn off the television. Turn off the web. We recorded a video on YouTube with the colonel who was on the ground when SARS broke out in 2003, Colonel Dr. Michael Lewis, and he says you have to turn off the television, and he's an epidemiologist, infectious disease hunter who ran the Pentagon. He said to me, Stu, turning off the TV and stop surfing the web may be more important right now than changing your diet or learning how to communicate because we're taking Mm -hmm. in too much negative information. Yeah, I agree. Number four? Hard to do. Four, we have to try relaxing. We have to try relaxing. I mean, you go back, the meditation, the deep breathing. There are many different breathing modalities online. We have to try relaxing. Even though it sounds impossible, we can do it. Try Tai Chi. Try yoga at home. Get some exercise. You know, if you can't find a place to walk outdoors, I was so inspired by the human who ran the marathon on his balcony in Italy. I think most of us saw that video, but if you're not moving around, you're going to disrupt the neurotransmitters in the brain that are required for proper brain cell to brain cell communication. It won't make sense what's going on in the world if you're not moving around. You make brain-derived nootropic factor, and listen to this, Dan, when you exercise, you make cannabinoids in your body. You make a compound called anandamide, which speaks to the THC receptor. That's right. When you have the runner's high, you're high on your own supply. So when you've talked to people that exercise all the time, they say, I don't need cannabis. I I feel electric. That's because you can flood the brain with anandamide, the bliss neurotransmitter to deal with stress, hit the CB1 receptor, and you're basically creating high on your own supply. And that got me motivated to start exercising again. And all that will help you sleep more if you don't sleep right. You will never, ever, ever recover. And that's where CBD before bedtime might make sense for some people. Right. And then finally, look at the other plants. If you like plants, learn about ashwagandha, chamomile, kava kava, lavender. Dan, did you know that 80 milligrams of lavender a day, one little capsule is equal to 0.5 milligrams of Valium? Did you know that, lavender? No, 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 I didn't. So um, these these seven points are there on your website? Uh, well, there's some videos on the YouTube, but uh, uh, it's really Colonel Lewis. He's you can listen to him. He's on YouTube, and all of our medical experts too. I just want to make it you know give people a taste of the original content that they'll learn about. And we don't sell okay. ashwagandha or chamomile or kava kava or lavender. I just want to show people that the health food store world and taking care of yourself is now no longer an option. Taking care of yourself is now mandatory. The only way we can navigate the storm is to take care of ourselves. So unfortunately, Stuart, um, as always, um, we're we're stuck with a clock, and the the content has been just phenomenal. Um, So we've been speaking with Stuart Tomek from CV Science, and you can go to his YouTube channel, and it's CV Science. What else is in the YouTube? Yeah, CV Sciences at YouTube. Yeah, just go to YouTube. CV Sciences on YouTube. You can look at Plus CBD Oil, but I'm not here to sell anything. Go to PlusCBDOil.com. But on YouTube, you see all the original lectures. And uh, you have a website where people can buy product. Yes, that's a PlusCBDOil.com, and it does link through the YouTube page. So you can go to the YouTube yeah, page, it, watch some of the videos, and connect. Is that the word plus or the plus sign? Oh, I'm sorry. It's just P-L-U-S-C-B-D plus C-B-D oil dot com. P-L-U-S-C-B-D oil dot com. And how can they follow you? Well, they can follow us on Instagram. They can follow us on Facebook. They can follow us on Twitter. And our medical and scientific advisory team, they respond. So please, you can follow us on all the social media channels. We're all over the place. Super. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. Love being on your show. You're listening to America's Cannabis Conversation on W420RadioNetwork.com.
Your new Cannabis Electronic Checking Account can offer you PIN secure credit and debit cards for your clients. We can place a cashless ATM at your checkout counter, which reduces the amount of cash on hand. Did you know that we can help you bring legacy cash into your new Cannabis Electronic Checking Account? No more paying with cash. Making payments with your electronic check is safe and secure. So if you find yourself up at night worrying about somebody breaking in and stealing your cash, consider a Cannabis Electronic Checking Account. To find out if a Cannabis Electronic Checking Account is right for you, call 888-420-8884 and ask for Dan Perkins. That's 888-420-8844. W420radionetwork.com. Welcome back to the conversation. And joining us today is Morgan Fox of the National Cannabis Industry Association, speaking to us from Washington, D.C., and you can hear the sirens in the background. Um, it's tough to do uh, interviews today in the uh, difficult environment that we live in many cities throughout the country. I've invited Morgan to the show today because I want to talk about the number of, of, of the riots that took place across the United States. I've seen article after article about dispens dispensaries that have it's been broken into, destroyed, and every piece of anything has been taken from them. And <clears throat> the last piece I saw was tens of millions of dollars is believed to have been stolen by the looters. Um, what is, uh, what do you think, uh, what, what is the industry association about this massive amount of looting, especially as it relates to cannabis dispensaries? Uh, well, let me start off by saying that NCIA wholeheartedly supports the movement to protect black lives and the protests that have occurred in cities around the country following the, uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, in terms of, uh, what has happened to a number of cannabis businesses, uh, Right now, reports uh, are all suggesting that uh, these acts were uh, not uh, perpetrated by uh, people associated with any of these protests, but were rather the work of organized criminals who were specifically targeting cannabis businesses uh, because of the well-known fact that they tend to have lots of cash on hand. And this is entirely because of lack of access to banking services in the cannabis industry. Right. So there, was, uh, there were several articles last weekend, just uh, three snippets. Um, a new car dealership in Northern California had 70 cars stolen. An antique car museum in Orlando, Florida had 19 cars stolen. And it appears that uh, looters uh, stole a forklift truck and knocked in the entire front entrance of a Best Buy store and literally stripped it clean. Uh, the, I've often wondered, and I've written commentary, can you put on a shirt that say Black Lives Matter, carry a cardboard placard, and then go steal 70 cars? Your, your contention is that they are different people who are doing the looting and especially the massive looting, which we just talked about. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, absolutely. And uh, it's not even that people are trying to disguise themselves as protesters. They're just using the, the fact that uh, police are hyper-focused on cracking down on protests and are not uh, protecting local businesses. Uh, but uh, even aside from that, you can just look at the reports. I mean, uh, uh, Magnolia Wellness in uh, Northern California uh, reported that uh, people were uh, coming into the store wearing a head-to-toe clean suit. Uh, that's the mark of a professional uh, criminal. Um, in uh, the Chicago Mission Dispensary, uh, the reports were that uh, a group of 40 to 50 armed individuals swarmed the store at once. Uh, these are the acts of organized uh, criminals who are acting on information that is very well known that because cannabis businesses cannot access banking services generally, they have large amounts of cash on hand, and that makes them extremely viable targets. You know, I, I, I appreciate you being candid with, with what you're saying, and, and it makes me want to ask you the question, not that I'm, expect, I'm making you a criminal expert, but it seems to me if you're going to if you're going to single out a dealership and steal 70 cars or break into a museum and take 19 classic cars or steal a forklift truck. A lot of that doesn't seem to me as spur of the moment that perhaps you're right in your characterization that it's, it's organized crime and they were looking for a set of circumstances and when the 
the Black Lives Matter thing erupted, they their their action plan went into effect rather rapidly, and they they did, and and that was the one thing that I noticed, uh, having reported for forty years, that this particular the the violence and the looting, it this particular situation was dramatically different than anything I'd seen before. Uh, and I didn't, I wasn't aware of all the armed people came into that one store, but I, as I said earlier, I had read a number of stories where dispensaries were just literally stripped. And, um, and so, so when we as Americans look at what's going on, how, how do we tell the good guys from the bad guys on television? Uh, well, I don't know if I can uh, really answer that, but I think that in this particular context, it's very clear that uh, um, the fact that cannabis businesses are uh, right targets for crime uh, was capitalized upon by opportunistic criminals. Uh, this has been pretty much the across-the-board uh, uh, reports that we've uh, received. Uh, and this was true even uh, before the pandemic, even uh, before the, uh, the protests against uh, police brutality and systemic racism. Uh, you know, it was one of the main reasons for trying to pass the state banking act that these businesses have a lot of cash. Uh, it's you know, obviously a financial problem for businesses to be able to protect that kind of cash and much more expensive for any sort of banking services that they can possibly get. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, public safety was uh, one of the major concerns of this bill. And uh, it's simply been exacerbated by our current uh, uh, pandemic and uh, uh, sociopolitical situation. So, you know, I, I, I looked at um, uh, I, I I wrote a piece and I used a, dispen- a cannabis dispensary and a jewelry store in the question that I was asking in the article, which is easier to sell cannabis product or the jewelry? And I think you can sell the cannabis product on the street in a heartbeat where it's going to take longer to sell jewelry or television sets or whatever. Um, there's obviously a demand for cannabis and it's highly marketable and I think highly sellable uh, so that it generate a lot more cash more quickly than stealing cars or, or diamonds or whatever. Um, so w- what are you telling people, if anything, to do? I mean, you had the one store you told us about how many people were came in armed. Was it 50? That's uh, the uh, the report that I heard. I, I'm not clear on the exact number, but uh, it's been okay. uh, heavily publicized. And uh, one of NCIA's board members, Chris Crane, who is a uh, co-owner of that company, uh, has made some very, very powerful statements regarding uh, how his company is dealing with that and uh, you know, reiterating the fact that uh, just had nothing to do with uh, with protesters. This was an organized uh, you know, criminal uh, response to an opportunity that uh, presented itself. Um, and I, you know, I think that that's a pretty fair assessment that you make regarding uh, the uh, um, illicit market marketability of uh, cannabis versus jewelry, and that's largely because there is still a very strong and viable uh, uh, unregulated market for cannabis, because cannabis businesses in the regulated market have such a difficult time competing with them uh, with uh, uh, unregulated uh, providers uh, because of all of the owner's financial uh, restrictions placed on them. So the illegal market, the black market, might be a place where robbers and looters would sell the cannabis uh, to them, uh, probably at a discount, but but they paid nothing for it, so it would be all cash, so that the the illegals uh, build their inventory at a reduced cost. I can't really speak to the uh, the inner workings of the uh, the unregulated market, um, at least uh, as it applies to the situation, but I think that there are a lot of market forces in play. And uh, all of them would be eased by allowing the regulated market to more easily compete on a level playing yeah. field. So, wh- why do you think? Um, why do you think the in the last number I saw, Morgan, you may have a more uh, up to date number, but that the illegal market was anywhere from two to four times bigger than the legal market in the United States. Have you heard anything more any different than that? Uh, nationally, that sounds roughly accurate. I think that it varies a lot from state to state, uh, and clearly states without any regulated markets. The uh, is, uh, unregulated market takes up 100% of the uh, the space. I guess my question to you is, and I'm probably uh, you've probably been asking it a gazillion times, so I apologize for being redundant, is 
if we know that it's there, if the government knows that the illegals are there, why is there still such a growing illegal market in the United States? Uh, well, I'm not sure it's necessarily correct to say that it's, uh, the uh, unregulated market is growing. Um, if anything, I think that it's probably shrinking because demand isn't necessarily increasing and more and more states are passing uh, uh, regulated market laws. Uh, mm -hmm. And these businesses are taking a huge chunk out of the unregulated market. Um, but uh, as long as these businesses are unable to compete on a level playing field and uh, really what it comes down to is consumer cost, as long as they are unable to offer uh, uh, products at a competitive price to consumers, there's going to be a section of the consumer base that will continue to uh, patronize the unregulated market simply because it costs less. And that's yeah. how we need to start uh, decreasing uh, uh, tax rates, both at the local, state, and federal level, decreasing some of these other financial burdens that are placed on businesses, allow them access to banking, and uh, make sure that they are in a competitive place so that uh, consumers across the board are able to get uh, affordable and uh, tested and uh, comparatively safe cannabis and not have to go through uh, 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 illicit sources. Well, I agree. Unfortunately, sir, we're out of time. Uh, I think this is an important subject. I appreciate you joining us today. We've been speaking to Morgan Fox of the National Cannabis Industry Association talking about uh, criminal activity in, dis in robbing dispensaries. Morgan, uh, thank you for joining us and tell us where we can follow you and your organization. Uh, the, the CannabisIndustry.org, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Introducing the new Cannabis Electronic Checking Account. Did you know that in 2019, almost one in five dispensaries were either robbed or broken into? Your business is cash only because up to now you didn't have access to a banking account that would allow you to deposit the daily receipts from your business. Some owners have started a banking relationship only to be told in a few months that the institution was closing the account. For the first time, you can now have a reliable business checking account. Yes, I said a secure bank electronic checking account. For more information, call 1-888-420-8844 and ask for Dan Perkins. That's 888-420-8884 and ask for Dan Perkins. W420radionetwork.com Welcome back to the conversation. And join us from Nairobi is John Kegya, who is the Chief Knowledge Officer for New Frontier Data. This is an organization that collects data and provides research, extensive research on the cannabis industry. John, thank you for joining us from Africa today. It's an absolute pleasure, Dan. Thank you for having us. So let's start off with a report that you did that looked at six-year anniversary of recreational cannabis in the state of Colorado. What did you learn, John? Quite a number of things in looking at how Colorado's market has evolved since legal, sa legal sales began uh, in January of 2014. First, the adult use market, the recreational market, has performed extraordinarily well. So over the past six years, uh, over $5.5 billion of cannabis products have been sold to consumers in Colorado. Um, and when you combine the medical and the adult use market, you have sales totaling nearly $8 billion. So this has been a phenomenal kind of revenue-generating opportunity, not just for the businesses that are operating in the state, uh, but also for the state. So, you know, Colorado's tax rate, which is a little under 30%, and, and the, the, the combined taxes that uh, uh, um, customers are paying uh, in total when they, when they purchase products, has allowed the state to earn over a billion dollars in taxes uh, over that period. And, um, you know, the, the, so this combination of this market not only uh, being a significant source of uh, new economic opportunity for entrepreneurs who uh, have been able to create a lot of wealth, a lot of jobs, uh, but also for the state, which has been able to find this uh, new, completely untapped source of 
uh, of tax revenue, uh, I think has been you know, just strong affirmation that cannabis legalization uh, is a real catalyst both for uh, economic development uh, as well as for uh, government revenue growth. We now have a, a, a shortage, apparently what appears to be a shortage of capital, at least in some parts of the country. So how is this, how is this affecting the growth potential in Colorado? So that's a really important question, and, and there's a number of convergent forces there that I think are important to unpack before we can talk about uh, uh, what the future is. So just first trying to understand how we got to where we are. Why did we mm-hmm. see such a dramatic decline in market values in 2019? Well, mm-hmm. to put it bluntly, there was, uh, and to quote Alan Greenspan, there was a lot of irrational exuberance uh, mm-hmm. in cannabis. So a lot of investors who put a lot of capital into this market um, at supercharged valuations with very dramatic, or with very kind of short-term expectations about how quickly the growth would be achieved without really an intimate understanding of how the, uh, the business, the economics, and the market of cannabis works. So the valuations that were being placed on these particularly uh, large Canadian publicly traded companies, but it also bled over to the, to the U.S. side, uh, was based on really un, un, unrealistic expectations of how quickly the markets uh, would, would catalyze the growth needed to return uh, value that reflected uh, these uh, very lofty expectations. And let's use Canada as a good example of this. Um, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance about uh, Canada being the first developed nation to legalize cannabis. Um, but what a lot of people weren't looking at was actually how that process was being affected. Um, there were major regulatory delays in, uh, in getting that market up and running. There were very strict rules around which products could be sold, uh, including you know, in the first year of operations, you couldn't sell anything other than flour or, or uh, broadly speaking, with a flour-only market. Uh, and third, uh, beyond what was happening at the national level, even at the, at the kind of local jurisdictional level, uh, within the provinces, uh, a, a lot of businesses had, uh, took a lot longer to get operational than had been expected. So when investors were applying money into these Canadian LPs, driving up their valuations to you know, $40 billion, it was with the expectation, one, that the Canadian market would be up and running virtually overnight, and then two, that these Canadian companies would go global and set up markets uh, in Europe, in Latin America, and in Asia Pacific, specifically in Australia, potentially in New Zealand. Um, without really understanding how long it actually takes to activate a market and to get that oper- market operating in a normalized uh, fashion. And so with people expecting you know, immediate term re- uh, returns in one or two years for a roadmap five, six, seven years to fully manifest, um, it's meant that you know, in 2018, a lot of investors started having that moment of sobriety, realizing, yes, the market opportunity is still there, but it's going to take a much longer time to, uh, to achieve that level of growth. And so you saw that market pullback. The market fundamentals remain the same. You know, cannabis demand, as we can see from Colorado, remains very strong. Uh, consumer demand, even in a COVID environment, has actually been catalyzed, has actually increased, uh, not declined. We know that cannabis, uh, based on every other uh, market contraction, is actually relatively recession-proof and that consumers will keep spending even as the economic circumstances may make, make, uh, make tighten. So the market fundamentals remain strong, but what I think uh, investors need to understand is that due to regulations, due to the uh, you know, time required to operationalize the market. Uh, these markets don't catalyze overnight. Uh, and as we can see in Colorado, it's taken six years for the legal market to cannibalize 80% of the total demand in the state. So if at the beginning of 2014, nearly 100% of the state's demand was being served by the illicit market, uh, six years later, we're seeing that uh, the legal market has now captured 80% of that demand. So for the people who thought that a market like Canada was going to overnight somehow uh, com- completely consume uh, uh, all of the demand uh, that was being served by the previously illicit market, um, we know from Colorado that it takes time to get there. It does get there, but you've got to factor that uh, growth uh, period into your outlook for uh, this market opportunity. John, do you think that this correction would have happened in the cannabis market and continue in, into 2000 and? 20, uh, regardless of the um, coronavirus 19? Absolutely. 
And to your point, the, the fact that we'd already seen such a dramatic correction uh, pre-COVID uh, indicates that you know, this market was already due for a correction. It's something that we have been talking about now for two or three years, saying that you know, some of these valuations just did not reflect the, the practical realities of, where, of how long it was going to take the markets to achieve its full potential. Uh, not that the market is not going to achieve that potential, uh, but it is going to take time, uh, particularly to understand how some of these larger markets are being regulated. You know, and so, so the, the correction would have happened pre-COVID. Uh, COVID has been an additional catalyst. However, we think that um, so the contraction that we saw at the beginning of the COVID pandemic did not account for, one, candidate businesses being declared essential in most parts of the country, and two, mm-hmm. the actual the, the increase in demand that we have seen is a function of people now being home, uh, at home uh, and spending more on cannabis. And so we actually think that there's some, some investors who uh, may have pulled out of the market at the initial part of this COVID pandemic who are now revisiting this market um, because they actually see that this is one of the few sectors of the economy that has continued to outperform uh, even amidst this much broader economic war mm-hmm. that we're seeing. It seems to me that the, the, the significant decline in valuations, um, but given the prospects, um, we might be close to a buying opportunity in some of these stocks that survive. What do you think? We completely agree with that assessment for a convergence of reasons. So first, um, you saw the acute market correction happening in, in 2019, coming into 2020, and then a further contraction uh, catalyzed by the COVID uh, um, pandemic. As a result, you're seeing um, these cannabis businesses at some of the lowest valuations that many of them have seen uh, in the past two to three years. Um, second, as we look at what's going to be happening over the next, um, let's call it 12 months, um, up until the November election, you have some uh, significant stakes that are in play. Um, COVID might just delay some of the non-ballot-based legalization initiatives, and here specifically I'm looking at New York and New Jersey. But just the fact that you've seen so much more commitment amongst legislators, uh, legislators in both markets around cannabis legalization that you, that you even saw in 2019 uh, means that we... we we now consider both New York and New Jersey uh, a matter of when, not if, in terms of legalization. And those are going to be two critical markets uh, and present a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, you have some critical states in play. Um, and so you're looking at uh, uh, states ranging from you know, uh, Arizona, which is a critical red state, uh, looking at adult use legalization, the numbers are looking very positive, to a host of, of new states like Missouri, which are considering uh, adult use legalization. Um, the, the expectation based on the latest data we have seen is that virtually every state that has a le- adult use, uh, medical or adult use legalization initiatives on the, on the ballot scheduled for uh, uh, November 2020 um, has a strong prospect of passing. So if you pick up um, 70 to 80 percent of those states, uh, then you know the, the, that adds further momentum to um, uh, the, the broader uh, national uh, opportunity that that will be created by the activation of these new markets. Um, and then third, you know, looking at the, the presidential uh, election itself, uh, the fact that now. You know, the Democratic Party, broadly speaking, has mobilized behind significant reform of federal law, means that we're likely going to see one um, something corresponding from the Republican Party, whether it's uh, a, a more limited around access to banking, access to, to medical research, and support for veterans' access to medical cannabis, uh, or even more potentially uh, a, a conversation around whether this now becomes a state issue uh, and the federal government uh, stepping away from, from prohibition uh, as we currently know it. Um, either way, we think that the, the fact that we will have so many medical and recreational uh, states in play for December, for November, um, and that we're going to see a lot more senators, a lot more members of Congress representing states that have legal regulated cannabis markets going into 2021 will mean that um, this issue is going to, uh, going to have a lot more political 
uh, support uh, going to next year and beyond. Well, John, uh, unfortunately, uh, our, we're, we're out of time for this segment, but I want you to tell people how they can reach you and follow you and follow your company. So please give us an uh, email or our web address, please. Thank you. Uh, you can reach us at newfrontierdata.com. Uh, that's newfrontierdata.com, where you can find access to not only the research that we've done in Colorado, uh, but all of the research that we've done around the THC markets, the CBD markets, and industrial hemp uh, around the world. We provide a lot of resources to investors, business owners, uh, lawmakers, and regulators, uh, and hope you'll take advantage of uh, all of the intelligence we provide. Super. John, thank you for joining us today. America's newest and fastest-growing cannabis-focused radio network is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing team. America's Cannabis Conversation offers listeners insight and information on the exploding world of cannabis. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach a hyper-targeted audience, literally neighborhood by neighborhood, in markets all across the country. We're looking for a few motivated individuals that want to essentially run their own local business in markets like Boston, Las Vegas, Reno, Orlando, and more. To learn more about this exciting opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Welcome back to The Conversation. And joining us today is a guest who I'm really excited about interviewing because he's showing the possibilities of how we might deal with this COVID-19 virus. Brent Zeidel from Zias Life Sciences out of Canada. Zias Life Sciences. Thank you for joining the conversation today. Good afternoon, Dan. Thank you. Um, I, I read a story about your company about doing some experimentation and study on whether or not cannabis can be an effective treatment for COVID-19. With that a, set up, pardon? No, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, with that set up, tell us what you're trying to do. Well, we are, uh, Zias Life Sciences is a, is, a, is, is a life sciences company, and we have two main areas that we focus on for um, producing in, in therapeutics. One is in the cannabis arena, producing cannabinoids that are designed for the medical arena. And the second mm -hmm. is uh, what I call therapeutic proteins. So proteins that are designed for having a, also a therapeutic value, such as enzymes, cytokines, and in this case, a vaccine. And the vaccine happens to be a protein. The, co the thread of uh, continuity between the two different, um, I would say, product types or medicine types is the fact that we use plants to produce them as opposed to any other system. So we're using whole system plants to produce them. So in the case of cannabinoids, we use, of course, the cannabis plant. In the case of proteins, we'll, we, we've looked at cannabis plants as a possibility vehicle to, to help design them, but we're, our, our technology platform that we spent the past 18 years of developing is more focused on using things that are legume plants, leguminous plants like a lupin species, as well as some tobacco species. Not the ones that are used for smoking, but others, cousins to the one that's used for smoking. So basically what we do is, what, we, what, we, what we're doing is we're focusing on having the plant, we teach the plant to make a certain uh, compound. And then from there, then we purify it and then make it ready for it to be used as a, as a true medicine. So you're doing that in both sides of your business. You're trying to re-engineer the plant to produce a certain protein that you desire to possibly be able to treat an illness or a sickness? Yeah, it's a, it's a, we don't actually, it's a design, it's a more of a design feature that we turn on certain aspects of that, of the plant, and we turn it on in a certain way uh, using a, some both uh, conventional breeding work, but also non-conventional breeding work. And we, we design the plant to make a certain, we teach it to produce that particular compound. And it's because it's a higher life form, and it's uh, it can be designed to make those kind of kind of compounds. Now, in the case of cannabis plants, we're not doing we're just doing traditional breeding to in order to make the plants produce a certain type of profile that we're after cannabinoid profile. 
Are, are you um, uh, do you harvest the result in a typical way that a uh, a cannabis plant is harvested to produce product for consumption? Yeah, we it, typically the, the business model is that we you know we had a long history. I've been involved with uh, with the cannabis industry since 2000, and the team that we have has been around in in and around uh, that time as well. And so the focus is at, really focused on the medicine side. So I, not, not to draw a, you know, too far a distinction, but the vaccine development is done in a, it, it's using the same technology, the same technology we developed and, uh, and within the cannabis um, development for making a medicine, we've now redeploy our expertise and our scientists into this other arena of producing a vaccine. So we have to use, uh, we've tar- decided to use a different, different type of plant to produce a vaccine. But at the mm-hmm. same time, it is, it's designed to produce the, the vaccine that would help as a, you know, as a preventative from getting COVID-19. Okay. So are you further along on the non-cannabis side in, in, in coming up with the possibility of some type of vaccine, or are you about even? About even, I would say. We, we, so what, in the cannabis side of the business, We've, we're awaiting a sales license from Health Canada. We've got uh, uh, oils, cannabis oils that we're manufacturing using ethanol process that are going to be released in the Canadian market hopefully later in 2020 with an eye of eventually moving into a global market in the exempted space for medical purposes. But then secondarily, we have, uh, we're doing clinical research on what we're referring to as a fixed dose combination. So we take three different cannabinoids and we apply them. One is designed for making for neuropathic pain. And the other is being designed for neuropsychiatry, so anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Mm. So we know from our history that there's two populations that we, over the years, we had 48,000 patients, and they were using a specific type of product that we were able to anecdotally observe that the populations were using this type of product for managing their symptoms related to those two different um, conditions. And so then we've now begun... We purified the, the compounds into a fixed dose, and now we can target those. And now we've entered into preclinical trials with some encouraging early results. So so that's on the you, cannabis side. Yeah, that's the cannabis that, side. then that's fine. I I I, I want to say it, it's. I want to ask you if it's fair to represent to my audience that by and large the the two areas that you're working in are natural solutions, as opposed to chemically compounded solutions. That's correct. So they're producing a plant. The plant produces them um, within their you know, genome that they produce them. And then the trick is, is, is extracting them after the fact in a, in a purified form. In the case of vaccines, it's a, the, the science has to be elevated a little more because you have to get it to a purified compound. Very, you know, and it only expresses it or push, produces a very, very small amount. Um, we're looking at a situation where um, there is great expectation in the United States for a vaccine soon. Uh, I'm also concerned that, that the vaccines which are artificially produced um, may not work. And, and we're going to, we're getting pressure. The government's getting pressure. How are we going to, inoculate 320 million people with this new vaccine. <clears throat> and it seems to me that if we have very little testing time, who knows what the ramifications could be to the American population if everybody is given the vaccine. Right. It's a fair, fair concern, Dan, to be honest. And I think the key thing here is what, what we're trying to do within the vaccine realm, realm is it's called an antigen. Is the is antigen is the na- is a name given to the protein that's part of the of the basic vaccine that we're working on. And this mm-hmm. antigen that we're creating, this that's a piece of protein, it mimics the external surface of the vac- of the virus itself. So it just mimics a portion of the of the of the virus is how it does it. So it mimics so that what it's doing is you if you were to insert that piece of protein into into a mammalian model, the natural immune system will identify that and build an antibody to, to, to fight it. And then when the real, if should the real thing show up, 
that'll act as a marker and a signal to the immune system educated that it can recognize this as a threat and it already has built in its memory bank the antibodies naturally that the uh, human system can produce. The reason that some of the young people don't get this vax viruses, COVID as, as strong as, as, as adults is because their immune systems are very adaptable and very quick in responding to the threat. So when, they, when the COVID virus shows up, their immune systems kick into high gear and they produce a, a, a natural antibody that fights it immediately and they don't get the symptoms. A lot of times mm. that's the case. In the case of more, as you think about people who are immunocompromised or have other conditions, their immune systems are taxed heavily, A, and B, they're older, so they tend to be a little tired. So the way of the, the reason for producing a vaccine is really is to help educate the immune system so that it can be prepared for when a COVID uh, virus shows up. And in our case, we've chosen this. We didn't choose it. Actually, we're working with another research organization called VITO, uh, VITO Vaccine Infectious Diseases Organization, which is part of the university here. And they've been working in the, uh, with a coronavirus and COVID for the past four or five years as it relates to cattle and pigs. And so they had a solution that they've now then been able to tailor for the same disease, but tailor it for human beings. And they're doing the animal model version of this and testing it in, in, in a proper disciplined way in the preclinical trials. And they actually use uh, ferrets to, to test because ferrets have a very similar lung system as us. So after they get through that, then the plan is to move them through phase one through three, phase three clinical trials. Yes, it takes time. And yes, we're trying to do it all correctly. What we've done is taken what they discovered and now put that into a, you know, not having a plant produce it as opposed to an animal cell. And now we can produce the, this very same protein and then have that then, exp then go through the same process, but show the equivalency of how, what they're doing on the other side to make sure to your point that it works well and it's safe for, for consumption and it is effective at preventing the vaccine from happening. Because you're doing it, virus it because you're creating it from a plant base, does that accelerate the, the time that clinical trials would take? It, it accelerates the scale-up ability. It accelerates, we're able to leverage with the work that they're already doing and have already done. We'll be able to do show bioequivalency on that whole thing. So it doesn't, uh, there is some efficiency, shall we say, in the clinical trial process that we'll be able to gain and to, to put it on a hurry up offense. So that doesn't take as long a review of different things, but it is data-based. I mean, our whole company is based on true science, not on having the whole thing. And we're not, you know, our main business is in the cannabinoid space. So we're focused on this vaccine to do it right, to make sure it's done in the best way. We might know, we might be last to the party in this case, because we're late to the game. But the other thing we're doing at the same time is we want to build in some robustness to the platform, as it's called, so that in case it mutates, we'll be able to also respond and come up with something a little quicker in case it mutates. So that's yeah, the that's idea the, behind what we're trying to do. So. That's one of the questions that people have is that the scientists are working on a certain strain of the virus, and if it mutates, um, there's no way of telling how successful it will be against a new, new mutation. Well, what you're probably going to find is viruses, to, to in some ways, are much slower at, you know, at, at this particular virus is much slower at mutating. So we'll have a, you know, probably a little um, more time than, say, the influenza uh, uh, treatments that have to be adjusted, right, for the different parts. But what you could imagine one day you'll have a vaccine that would be, um, that would be sensitized to whatever COVID version that's floating around and you might have to have it so that you can address a number of them. And I think that's what the baseline science is about. So if we teach a plant to do a certain one, it'll do a certain one. But if you have the ability to then shift and go into a different production stream using the same platform, then that would be a benefit to everybody because it'll be tested already in its baseline as being effective and safe. Well, unfortunately, Brett, we're out of time, but I do want you to take a moment and tell people how they can follow you and your organization of what you're doing. Sure. If you look at Zyus.com, Z-Y-U-S.com, we'll be posting all our press releases along there, and we'll, we'll also have a, and that's a, we'll have a .ca later on in the year, but .com, Zyus.com is where you can find all, all the updates of what we're doing. It's been informative and interesting and promising, and thank you for your time. 
Thank you for taking part in America's Cannabis Conversation. To hear this show in its entirety or to hear any of our archive shows, log on to americascannabisconversation.com and tune in next Saturday at 4.20 p.m. for the next installment of America's Cannabis Conversation.